Attention. Attention. Hey, still no picture. Here is a news flash. Out of the unknown. Case one in the colors. In every city, in every continent, strange beings from another planet have launched an invasion of our Earth. The men from planet seven are landing. Wherever you are, whoever you are, watch out for the men from planet seven. They are armed. They are all powerful. They carry the most fantastic weapon ever to be faced. A weapon you will not be able to resist. A weapon they will not hesitate to use. Hello, I'm Andrew. Hello, I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 45 of... Round the Archives. Well, there's a packed programme tonight, isn't there, Lisa? There is, of course, Ronnie. (laughs) So, Tim Worthington will join us to talk about... Here come the Double Deckers. Good evening, Lisa. Good evening, Andrew. And good evening, Tim. Good evening, both of you. Thank you. Hello, Tim. Thank you for joining us again. Well, today we're going to look at the Double Deckers. So tell us why you love the Double Deckers. Well, part of the reason I love it is kind of a reason I have to be pedantic here, which is it's actually, and nobody ever gets this right, here come the Double Deckers exclamation mark. And that exclamation mark is a huge part of the show's sort of tonality. And I suppose a huge part of the reason I love it, because when I was a kid, I was, I mean, I still like these things now, I still find them funny, but according to my family, I would scream laughing at things like this, Rent-A-Ghost, the goodies, the monkeys, the banana splits, anything where, it's wrong to say slapstick, because I wasn't mad on, you know, old black and white films, or Don and Pete, the inserts from Cracker Jack. Where, you know, it was just a slapstick thing happened. Anything where there was kind of a madcap plot behind it, where escalatingly strange things happened, or anything like that was absolutely what I was interested in. Here come the Double Deckers, I'm sure you'll agree, really fitted that bill, because very, very strange things happened in it all the time. Well, the, the, the idea of a, a film series, it sort of springs from something that we didn't really know much about, Mm-hmm. Uh, called The Magnificent Six and a Half. Now, can you just fill us in on, on the background to that, please? Yeah, I mean, again, this was something I knew about Here Come the Double Deckers years before I'd even heard of that, but apparently it was the late 60s. You know the way you used to get short films before films in the cinema? A lot of them were made by the Children's Film Foundation. This was a series of films, kind of with a kind of recreating the... I believe they're based on the R Gang shorts from the... The American shorts from, was it the 30s? Which I've never had a tremendous amount of time for, I must admit. But they were kind of madcap late 60s 
very pop art designed sort of escapades about kids hunting ghosts and so on where there, it, there was always a silly reason behind everything they did and I think they did three series of it the third series had a different cast and a different writer and director the first two series were done by I think a producer called Harry Booth who then said I want to make this into a TV series got backing from 20th Century Fox have all these kids running around in London on a giant bus no, which isn't really what the American networks were looking for at that point. And that's where Here Come the Double Deckers came from. But you've also got involvement from a familiar name, if you know your black and white Doctor Who, uh, a certain Glyn Jones. Writer of the Space Museum, which is famously one of Doctor Who's most unloved stories. I love that first episode, though. In fact, if you go on my site, you'll see an article about how much I love the first episode and tried to make myself love the other three on the back of that. It didn't quite work, but he also acted in Doctor Who. But yes, he wrote this, which is about as far removed from the Space Museum as you can get, really. I mean, for a start, things actually happen in it. Well, yes, you say he acted in Doctor Who because he's in the Sontaran experiment. And I've always yes. got... I've I've always got an image in my head of him sort of buttonholing Philip Hinchcliffe and saying we could do a series with a Time Lord who travels through time and space in a double-decker bus. <laughs> Which, of course, later became Iris Wildtime, the big Finnish character, when you think about it, who, whose TARDIS was a double-decker London bus. <laughs> I can just imagine sort of Philip Hinchcliffe sort of edging away nervously. <laughs> Not quite enough gothic horror for me there, lads, but... <laughs> But but the episode we're looking at today is Invaders from Space, which is a fairly simple plot as mm-hmm. as they go. Yeah. Uh, you do get a couple of decent guest stars, but sadly there's no Melvin Hayes in this one. No! Though he's credited as dialogue coach, isn't he? Well, well that's the thing. He do- Melvin Hayes sort of pops up every now and then as Albert the Street Sweeper. Mm-hmm. But he's also credited as dialogue director mm. on all these all these episodes. And I just wonder what that actually involves. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, the dialogue isn't especially sophisticated or difficult. I mean, there are funny lines in it, but most of the humour in it is from the, the situations, the kind of elaborate slapstick gags. And I will say, the kids are all brilliant actors. I mean, I could quibble over the fact, in the opening titles, some of them have clearly had dancing lessons and some haven't. And you can spot a mile off who who were the stage school kids and who were the ones they discovered, you know, just roped in off the street almost. But as they really work together as a team, they seem like an actual gang. And their reactions and their looks to the camera and their looks at each other and their timing, all spot on. But, you know, that doesn't leave much room for much really involved dialogue, which is quite often, I'll do this, yes, you would do that, wouldn't you? You know, it's the... I mean, there was one great gag in this, I noticed, which was an exchange between, I think it's Brains and Scooper, which is, we need a strategy, we've got to keep one step ahead of them. How? Well, that's where a strategy comes in, which is quite a good gag in my book. But yeah, well, what dialogue was he coaching exactly? Was it was that a real sort of put his feet up with a cup of coffee kind of day? He's also one of three people who shares the credits for the title song, mm-hmm. which does seem to be like sort of uh, using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, really, mm-hmm. but never mind. But everybody sort of remembers the opening titles because... Um, we start off in in the junkyard with the doors opening, which uh, you know might cause a few Doctor Who memories to, <laughs> to to come out. And they're all there, as you say, singing and dancing away. What what Sticks is doing in the laundry basket? I really don't know, and unless he's doing <laughs> unless he's doing a Mister Sin tribute act or something like that. But Lisa, you, you said about um, sort of female representation in this, yes. didn't you? Go on then. Yes. It always slightly annoys me that the only thing, but the thing Billy has to do in the opening titles is water the plants. <laughs> yes! Yeah, that really annoys me as well. But, uh, yes, that, 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 that's, that's clearly what girls do. Yes. But you, you said about Harry Booth, but he's also director of some of the On the Buses films as well. Mm-hmm. So clearly he's got a, he's got a link with buses. But yeah, we we start off Brains is uh, trying to uh, turn a black and white TV into colour mm. and he's got the back off and he's poking about inside. Which looks really dangerous. Yes! Yeah. But mm. uh, they, they pick up a news, fla- a news flash or what they think is a news flash mm-hmm. about invaders from space. And this is actually an advert 
for some candy mm -hmm. and I notice it's from Planet 7 yeah. these spacemen are from <laughs> which I just wonder if you know your astronomy Glyn Jones had put Uranus which is the seventh planet in our solar system and that got crossed out you know you can't do Uranus gags at, at sort of this time of night yeah and who would who would call their planet planet seven as well <laughs> oh i know a great name for us planet seven <laughs> that will strike fear into our enemies but yeah donut comes in and he's mm. got candy balls apparently I, I don't know why you're laughing at that lisa there is a golf club around here called sandy balls i know so yeah. you know but they wonder, they worry that donut's been contaminated. Mm -hmm. So they, they they stick him in a in a bath and uh, yeah. It's not in a bath. It's like a sort of packing case with water in, isn't it? Or... It's like an Ibiza foam party. Mm. <laughs> but Tim, you said this is part. This is partially reminiscent of a certain Doomwatch episode as well in your in your head. Well, yes, there were a few things that reminded me of. I mean, there's the... Around the same time, there was the Doctor Who story, The Ambassador to Death, which it does share some similarities with, including the space suits that the spacemen are seen wearing are quite similar. But yeah, there's the episode of Doomwatch, The Devil's Sweets, which again was on, I think, very shortly before this was first shown on the BBC, which is about an advertising campaign for some cigarettes where the manufacturers are giving out sweets to people in the streets, which I think I'm right about this. It makes them susceptible to the design on the packets so that they're kind of hypnotized into buying the cigarettes and part the doom watch secretary has a sort of allergic reaction to it and uh it's it's one of the better episodes of doom watch that because it brings real emotion into it because one of the team is it's you know not just at risk from a computer that is saying Rah! at them in machine code you know there's actual peril in it and that really really well and there's a lot of you know proper concerns of the time in there and it's it's weirdly close to that and i'll be honest with you when they notice the broadcast on Brains' TV, the kids do fear really well. It's not a comedy reaction. While well, moving slightly later into the 70s, I know this is probably based loosely on the, the Orson Welles War of the Worlds radio hoax, but it made me think of Rilla the Vashtar Galactic Command, which I think was in 1977 when somebody, nobody still knows who, hijacked the audio of the, I think it was the Southern TV news signal, Pretended to be an alien saying Earth must give up its nuclear weapons <laughs> and so on. And it really kind of pitches it at first. You don't know what's going on. That's And that's quite an odd thing for a show like this, really. Because I noticed that the soundtrack in this episode is, is has got a bit of a split personality because you get some quite sinister music when they see the spacemen. And then when you get into the like the speeded up film sequences, you're, you're back to like the swanny whistles and the comedy boings and things like that. So, yeah, it is a sort of fifty percent fear, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the kids see the the, the spacemen who are sort of lurking about outside um, the junkyard that they that they live in, or at least hang about in. I have to ask uh, Tim, um, s shows with kids in gangs. Were they identifiable to you? Because because I lived like in the middle of the country, and if I was in a gang, it was it would consist of me, two cows, and a blackberry bush. You know, there were no <laughs> other kids that could be in a gang. But you get you get shows like this. You get Graham's gang, and you get the Red Hand gang. So, w were gangs a familiar thing to you as a kid? Well. Kind of, because obviously I had a slightly more urban upbringing. And, you know, funnily enough, we were all talking about this the other day, how, you know, quite often from a very young age, we'd be playing out in the street and how, you know, I don't want to get all, oh, it was better in those days, whatever. But we were all saying about the fact that it would be a, a big thing if a car came and you had to stop the game of whatever it was. And, you know, everyone moved to the pavements or whatever. It happened about two or three times a day. If that, you know, you think now... That's that's very, very different. But it was in a way, but it depended how the gangs were pitched. I mean, things like this, things like, like you say, Graham's gang, things like Murphy's mob to an extent where it reflected what might actually happen, you know, while you were out playing rather than, you know, never really got the famous five because that wasn't very... <laughs> 
relatable to what we got up to. But it's like I've always said about what I most identified with in Grange Hill was the, the bits where they were going to and from school. You know, either something would happen when they're walking down the street or they get into trouble on the bus or whatever. That really struck a chord with me in the in a way that the school bits maybe didn't. So, yeah, it was quite identifiable. I would say out of our family, I was the most double-deckers-like of all of them. <laughs> I think that's probably why it appealed to me, was I, I was more prone to wacky slapstick adventures, really. So it does beg the question, which one would you be in the gang? I don't know what the others would have said in response to that. I would take a guess I was probably Tiger, because I was quite a stroppy little kid who thought, you know, they had a more adult way of thinking than they possibly did. Probably thought they were better at working things out than everyone else. And used to say, that's not fair. I can do that just as well as you. So, yeah, I was probably Tiger. Okay, fair enough. Well, <laughs> the kids all sort of don tin helmets for part of their strategy. <laughs> um, and where tin helmets are not available, they resort to crash helmets or, in Donut's case, a piss pot. Yeah, he always has to be the fall guy. Did you notice as well, when they run off trying to hide initially before they put their armour on, Donut tries to slide himself backwards into a waste paper basket. Yes, his, his bottom's slightly too large, isn't it? Yes, he's, he's not... He's... <laughs> I also noticed that Brains, um, making full use of the fact that this is a colour film series, mm-hmm. um, has got completely unmatching clothes. <laughs> He's got this like burgundy ja- jacket, a blue tie, a mustard shirt. Um, it just looks horrible. <laughs> He's like he's like the Colin Baker of, of you know costume, isn't it? <laughs> But this this advert campaign is is all is being organised by John Horsley, who mm-hmm. you might know from Reggie Perrin mm-hmm. as uh, Doc Morrissey, and I also wrote down Sam Kid Claxon, yes, as well, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Always great to see Sam Kid in things, mm-hmm. and of course his son yes. is Jonathan Kid, yes, of Pipkins, Pipkins fame, yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. And I've always wanted to know on the Pipkins DVD, we had an interview with him when he talks about when he left. He said, "Well, I left. Well, I was asked to leave." And he doesn't elaborate on that, and I want to know what happened. There. <laughs> Did he just get fed up and punch Moody the Badger or something? But we briefly see, we briefly see Ivor Salter as a policeman, yes. and he's often in the show. He's, he's yeah. yeah. Um, but in the end, the kids end up hiding in the van of the spaceman and get mm-hmm. driven off. The to their warehouse. Yeah. Um, given that this is an, an Anglo-American production, and I think it was shown in America before it was shown over here, I noticed there's a reference to a candy store mm. rather than a sweet shop. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Um, but we end up in this warehouse, which is full of cardboard boxes, mm-hmm. like in the war machines. Yeah. And I said to you, Lisa... You can tell those are going to fall over at some point, yeah, can't you? they're all stacked there ready, aren't they? Yeah. I note the vans are G-Reg, which means it's from 1968, which makes it quite new in the filming, mm-hmm. although it still, yeah. looks, it still looks knackered to me, but mm-hmm. hey. As you said about sort of the kids acting, there's a bit where all the kids are on one side of the cardboard boxes and, <laughs> and Donut's got to try and get across to them. <laughs> And, and, and all the faces he manages to pull in yeah. like 30 seconds are rather yeah. wonderful. Yeah, he didn't really do much else, did he, Douglas Simmons? And yeah, he was great in it, I thought. But yeah, we we end up with a, a pie in the face for the one of the spacemen. And then, mm-hmm. and then the kids attack with a fire extinguisher. And um, these sort of... Well, they're not ping pong ball guns, are they? Because they're meant mm. to have the candy inside them. Yes. <laughs> Although Brains has got one on the radiator, so it melts and just squirts out chocolate at them. (laughs) Eventually, they sort of confront John Horsley in his office and and say that they only wanted to save the world. Mm -hmm. And and I wrote down, imagine kids wanting to save the world these days. Mm. (laughs) I'm sure if Piers Morgan watched this, he'd go on about, I don't know, spring being a snowflake or whatever. He wouldn't like spring at all, would he? But... (laughs) But yeah, yeah. Basically, they get rewarded with uh, candy for all, mm-hmm. and we get one of those um, ha ha scenes at the end with Donut having eaten too much, and looking really, really green. <laughs> They've gone to, yes! gone to sort of time with the makeup. 
But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a fun little episode. Uh, why did you nominate this one? Is it a particular favourite of yours? or? Well, it was a particular favourite of mine as a child, but it's taken on some extra resonance since for a couple of reasons, which is, one, it's given the space elements of it. It's quite unlike the other episodes, which are often sort of more mundane pursuits that they get caught up in. And yeah, they actually do think they're being attacked by aliens in this, which is quite an unusual thing. But the other thing that strikes me about it these days is not only does it effectively have children, not just them, taking sweets from men in the street. They might be just a spacemen, but that's happening. But they also get in a strange van and go off in it. Now, I don't remember this happening, but I can easily see... This being the sort of thing where, I don't know if this still happens now, but do you remember sometimes there'd be a random episode or something where something had happened in it and the continuity announcer would come in over the end credits and say something like, remember, it's okay for the double deckers to go into a strange van, but you must never do this. I'm sure they must have had that kind of caveat at the end of it, really. I mean, that did used to happen a lot, didn't it? And I do remember thinking, even as a kid, did somebody not think when they were making this that there might be, there might be an issue with it? Well, we should also point out that, um, re- returning to the Doctor Who references, you can spot a genuine police box yeah. in the film yes. sequence at one yeah. point. It, it's in the distance, but it is there. You can you can see it. Uh, you, you get the end credits, which consist of still photographs of things in various colours. Um, I have to say, though, as a sort of chemist, I don't know what is going on with brains flasks. Because he's got a load of chemistry glassware on a load of stands, and I, it, it's always that sort of chemistry that annoys me in things that I don't know what he's trying to do, but it won't work. And <laughs> and, and and the famous um, "see you next week" mm-hmm. thing that you always get at the end. Although I remember a letter in Viz once where somebody complained that that was misleading because it was also at the end of the final episode. Yes! And they, they didn't see you next week. And also, I think when ITV repeated them in the early 90s, I think there was a huge gap in the middle of it. So they affected that as well. But it's only actually 17 episodes, isn't it? And Yeah! And it, it's one of those shows that was so repeated so often, it always felt like a lot more. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I assume the reason it's only 17 was probably to do with child labour laws over here. You know, had it been made in America, they would probably have made 52 a year and they would have gone on for six years. But, I mean, there are other stories about there was that band, uh, was it our kids that won Opportunity Knocks where nobody thought to check how many hours they were allowed to work a year and they couldn't do a second single because they worked the full time. So I assume, you know, some of the cast were already quite busy. I mean, Brinsley Ford did a lot around that time because he's he was in Please, Sir, at one point. He was in The Georgian House, the really, really frightening ITB children's drama. You know, so it must have been balanced out with other stuff that some of the cast were doing. So that's probably why it was so short, I think. Yeah, I mean, a, f- a few of the kids do sort of pop up a, a lot later in a, in a few sort of uh, series people might know because um, uh, Julian Bailey turns up in the first episode of Blake Seven, mm-hmm. and it took us years to work that out. I'd, I'd never clocked it was her. And she's Callie and Folly Foot as well, which a lot of people don't realise. Oh, we've not seen that. Oh mm. no! All right. And Brains uh, turns up in the Tomorrow People in the Thargon Menace. He does. Oh, he does! I'd never noticed that, but you're absolutely right. That's him, isn't it? Yeah, and again, I, I'd never made the connection until recently. Yeah. And so. of course, the most the most recognisable one is Peter Firth, who yeah. went on to have a very successful career and is yeah. still working to this day. Yeah. So, and it's also not bad for guest stars. Um, <clears throat> you, you've got you've got Clive Dunn and Pat Coombs. Um, you've got Betty Marsden and Hugh Paddock. And, of course, you've got TV's Michael Charvel Martin, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that always scores points in, in mm. my book. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a fun series, but I, I, I don't know sort of coming to it fresh 
if you've not seen it, I, I, I don't know wh whether there's much of a fandom for it or not, really. Or, or is it just like old people that like, like me and you that can remember it? Oh, I, th I think I think it's absolutely that. I don't think it's a series that people would really get if they saw it, you know, for the first time out of context. I mean, you know, the only people I know who at all like it are people my age. So, <laughs> But I think one thing, though, that really gets overlooked about it is the theme song is, you know, it gets parodied quite a lot, and obviously it was co-opted in that. Which Bewitched song was it? Where they do actually say, get on board, get on board. But the, it's very cleverly done, because obviously they change the lyrics in the end theme to, you know, you've been on board, you've been on board. And while it's a couple of years after its time, it's, it's exactly like something that you would have got, kind of the bands that followed in the wake of the move and sort of Revolver era Beatles doing when they were trying to get a hit single. In fact, it's very, very like a song called William Chalker's Time Machine by a band called The Lemon Tree. It was written by one of the move for them, which I think was, it was very nearly a hit in 1967. It's a very, very similar song. And, you know, for a kid's show around that time, to have a theme that kind of, even if it was slightly behind the times, pop chart friendly, sung by the cast as well, it's quite unusual, really. Which brings me round to another thing about this episode that struck me while I was watching it this time, is the whole thing about aliens firing sweets at children. Reminded me of another late 60s psychedelic single, which just nearly charted, which was a band called Time Box, who... Did mostly quite serious singles, but they had a single called Bake Jam Roll in Your Eye, which is about some aliens who come to Earth and think they will conquer the populace by f catapulting Bake Jam Roll at them. And I do wonder if somebody had heard that and thought, what? I sort of filed it away for later use. Well, you say about the theme tune, um, I've just put a poll up on Twitter. Um, I don't know whether you've seen it yet, um, but there is, there is a... A line in the in the theme tune that is that is now troubling me because they sing about a double 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 decker bus right yes they do <laughs> and i want to know whether they mean it's got six decks i.e two plus two plus two or whether it's got eight <laughs> decks two times two times two so well, I can tell you a quite amazing fact about that lyric, which I only found out recently, was that the band Happy Mondays, who paraphrased a lot of kind of 70s and 80s pop culture in their lyrics, often to make a, a point of some description, in their song Do It Better, Sean Ryder sings several times towards the end, uh, I won't say how many times he said good in a row, but then sings double, double, good, double, double, good. And that was apparently an intentional reference to on our double, double, double decker bus, which is... I love that, that that he thought to reference that, that that had clearly troubled him as well, to the point where he included it in a song about, I don't actually know what Do It Better's about, I'll be honest about that. Well, once our poll results are in, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to give you the definitive Twitter opinion yes. on, on <laughs> how many decks this theoretical bus has got, <laughs> but they, they never get it under a low bridge, no matter no. how many decks it's got, so... <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, there would be the constant even now to say, please don't drive your double, double, double decker bus under low bridges. It's all right with the double deckers to do that, but you must never do that. I, I did notice one thing when they um, in the advert when they're firing the guns off and, mm -hmm. the, and the chocolate balls are flying out, they all go on the floor and it's wet, and the kids are picking it up and eating it. It's <laughs> really unhygienic. <laughs> Yeah, if you look back at it again, the the ground is actually wet. It's obviously just rained. All right. Oh, I hadn't noticed that. So, yeah. But there you are. There's the invaders from space. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting li little one. I, I say we we do we do miss the fact that there's a there's no Melvin Hayes in it because um, he's a local lad, isn't he? He lives he, he lives on the Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight. So yes. yeah, he's yeah. he's yet another Isle of Wight person. <laughs> But thank you very much for that, Tim. And uh, yes, hopefully we've uh, um, sort of alerted a few people to this because mm -hmm. we, we always get people saying um, there are series you cover that, that we've never heard of mm -hmm. and they, they appreciate that. And yeah, I think this is now in danger of becoming a rather forgotten series, isn't it? Really? Yeah. yeah. OK, Tim Worthington. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye. <laughs>
Many thanks to Tim. Yes, thank you, Tim. It was much fun to do that. And as always, we point you towards Tim's wonderful podcast, Looks Unfamiliar. We do indeed. Right. Uh, we've got the results of my poll mm-hmm. about what a double, double, double decker bus actually is. Yes. And with a massive 15 votes, the internet <laughs> has spoken. 26.7% of people mm. think it has six decks mm-hmm. and 73.3 percent of people think it has eight decks okay i would have gone for six myself but yeah. that's just me mm-hmm. seems people prefer multiplication over addition okay uh we also got a message from mark braxton mm-hmm. of the radio times of the radio times saying i was convinced wilf Lunn had designed that cockamamie contraption that allows the deckers into their den i loved it okay i always like the idea that everybody in television in whatever show they're in, always knew everybody else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> quite, quite like oh, that. It's the, it's the wrong channel, isn't it? Oh. It was on BBC One. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember. I'm not old enough. <laughs> uh, Warren mm-hmm. pointed something out yes. in the title sequence yes. when we showed it to him. And mm-hmm. I must have seen it a hundred times or more. Mm-hmm. But I'd never noticed when they're jigging about on the back projection at the yeah. top of the bus. Mm-hmm. The whole side of the bus next to Spring is missing. All right, okay, so I could plummet to his death any second. Yeah, so much for health and safety. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm. But next up, mm-hmm. Martin Holmes returns to look at Hill Street Blues. Dispatch. Unlike with significant music albums that can sometimes make the dubious claim to have changed the way pop music was manufactured, there are very few television programmes that can genuinely claim to have changed television as we knew it forever. You could argue that certain significant new movements like Rolling News or Breakfast TV certainly changed British television, even if they were based upon the existing American model and not necessarily for the better, but very few dramas or comedies can honestly be held up as pivotal and signifying a moment where everything before seems different to everything afterwards. Perhaps Monty Python's Flying Circus is a good example of a comedy influencing everything that followed, but it was in itself inspired by the work of Spike Milligan, and its antecedents were already visible on screen in shows like Do Not Adjust Your Set and At Last the 1948 Show. One drama series I think that can genuinely stake a claim for having influenced just about everything that followed was Hill Street Blues, which was created by Stephen Bochco and Michael Kozol and debuted in January 1981 before running for seven troubled seasons in which producers were regularly fired and replaced and the series sometimes struggled to find an audience and be saved from cancellation due to ratings and budgetary concerns. Thankfully, Hill Street Blues did survive, become multiple award-winning and much-loved, and ultimately ran for those seven magnificent seasons before disappearing off to TV heaven and peculiar spin-off territory with a mostly unfamiliar cast. The pilot episode, directed by Robert Butler and written by Kozol and Bochco, is an astonishing and breathtakingly fast piece of television, even now, nearly four decades later. An otherwise blank screen quietly bears the caption, Roll Call, 6.53am, and we fade up to a scene of utter chaos, which is the briefing room of Hill Street Station, where Sergeant Esterhouse, played by Michael Conrad, who often played villains in shows like The Rockford Files, is briefing and updating the day shift before they go on duty. This is not the familiar polished view of ordinary police officers that would have been familiar to viewers of cop dramas in those days. This disparate and surprisingly diverse bunch look almost exactly the same as the villains and hoodlums they would later be arresting. 
Immediately, we see that these are not your average TV cops as their sergeant runs through the stories of the day, which cleverly fills us in on a lot of what we're going to see later if you're listening carefully above the overlapping dialogue, endless interruptions and various cuts to extraordinary pieces of the action. There are references to a cross-dressing purse snatcher that received the predictable responses in such a high testosterone environment, and warnings of the expected retaliations to recent gang homicides as if these are everyday occurrences and a directive that all officers are to hand over their illicit and illegal weapons, which leads to the sight gag of a table rapidly filling with an astonishing arsenal of weaponry, which is just as rapidly retrieved once this morning meeting has been adjourned. The first faces we see are J.D. LaRue and Neil Washington, played by Keel Martin and Turian Blach, later revealed to be undercover detectives and one of the great pairings that this series offers up for dramatic effect. They are also, in comparison to the rest of the shift, fairly ordinary looking. This is not central casting's idea of what a police station might look like. This is a room full of characters as diverse and individual and hairy as real life sometimes is probably drawn from the very best character actors, the like of which you might seldom have seen or had your eyes drawn to on television before. And whilst J.D. flirtatiously retrieves another weapon from one of his female admirers, Sergeant Esterhouse pauses for that magic moment to get his officers to listen as he delivers that immortal talismanic line of Hey, let's be careful out there which is respected enough to silence even this bunch just for a second, bringing a touch of the genuine fears and hopes of the average we-don't-know-what-the-hell's-going-to-happen morning of these officers of the law into stark, sharp focus in one magical line. Let's pause and think about that scene again. As an introduction, we meet several characters, get filled in on the story so far in a world already built before this pilot even starts, and we are already aware that the forces of chaos are working on both sides of the struggle. This is a real and complete world full of living, breathing characters, none of whom we have met yet. The chaotic storytelling and soundtrack must have bewildered anyone tuning in for the first time back in 1981, and whilst we are going to get to know some of these new faces fairly quickly, I imagine it all felt pretty scary if you were looking for the new Columbo, Kojak or Ironside series. Next, we are introduced to Officers Hill and Renko, just after Renko has completed one of his morning sit-downs and already featured in the morning melee, who are another of the show's great pairings. Bobby Hill is played by Michael Warren, and he has a love-hate relationship with his redneck Texan partner, Andy Renko, as played by Charles Hade. As they discuss Renko's brand new tall man-making cowboy boots, and Renko demands some respect from the wolf-whistling hookers who have just been delivered by the astonishingly scruffy and diminutive firebrand detective Mick Belker, played by Bruce Whites, bellowing his first hair bag of the series to their pimp, the khaki officer Leo Schnitz, played by Robert Hirschfield, offers the women a choice of smoking or non-smoking cells as we cut to the opening titles and can pause a moment to breathe. What an introduction. And this crazy whirlwind of an episode has barely started. There's hardly a moment to appreciate that iconic theme music by Mike Post or those iconic titles with occasional broad smiles and scenes from the series that burned into my brain when this series was first shown on Channel 4 in the UK, so much so that seeing the later series titles with different scenes can seem bizarre to me now before we're back into the organised chaos again. Two rival gangs fall out through the glass in a divided waiting area, and as everyone who is anyone pitches in to keep the peace, we meet Lieutenant Ray Calatano, René Enriquez, the well-meaning Hispanic liaison officer. It's interesting to note how wonderfully shabby the astonishingly well-designed Hill Street Station set is, so much so that it's been mimicked time and again, and its most obvious current successor is that of the station in the much-loved comedy Brooklyn Nine-Nine, although its grubby, life-worn look was itself possibly influenced by John Carpenter's seminal assault on Precinct 13. All of this occurs as we are on our way into Captain Frank Furillo's office, where he and Esther House are on the phones trying to sort out another little complaint involving wrong arrest warrants and trying to get rid of the arrested perpetrator as quickly as possible, with Esther House wittily lamenting the loss of the days when such paperwork was written in pencil as a sharp aside. And as he also discusses police interfacing with another bureaucrat on the other line... This is our introduction to series star Daniel J. Trevanti, portraying the police captain responsible for trying to keep a lid on the urban potboiler that is Hill Street Precinct. Then, Joyce Davenport arrives, played with 
effortless coolness by Veronica Hamill, and for the predominantly male members of the precinct, time seems to stop as they drool. Ray and Phil included, although Ray wishes she was twenty pounds heavier, whilst Officer Lucy Bates, Betty Thomas, looks on with slightly less admiration in a world-weary, seen-it-all-before kind of a way. Lucy Bates would feature more prominently in the series later on, but she doesn't get much to do in this action-packed pilot, to be honest. Joyce is a character seemingly much feared amongst the great and the good of Hill Street, as she represents the legal profession and seems insistent on the police officers respecting the letter of the law when dealing with the offenders she represents in her job at the Public Defender's Office. Much to her chagrin, Frank forces her to wait as he sorts out the current mess, leading to an encounter with J.D. LaRue, who foolishly tries to chat her up and gets a silent but deadly response. After that, Joyce adds to Frank's perpetual headaches as they discuss a misplaced witness, alleged pervert, who the Hill Street boys don't want to quite call missing and threatens to charge Frank with contempt, a bridge that he is not yet quite ready to be driven off. Crisis. Momentarily averted, there is a sudden outbreak of chaos in the holding area as a detainee suddenly explodes in fury and a growling belker leaps into the fray, only to be deeply hurt by Ferrillo's bellow of no biting in an astounding piece of character building. Belker is deeply hurt by this, as he only ever bit off one nose and it was three years ago and nobody ever lets him forget it. Meanwhile, Lucy is soothing the man who lost control as he lies in a heap of police officers in her only other major scene in this episode. This is all witnessed with a heartfelt sigh by Joyce and JD moves in to rescue her before leading her away from the war zone and asking her what she does to let her hair down. Her hair is already down, as she points out to him brusquely. We cut to Hill and Renko on patrol in their vehicle, having a discussion about their contrasting personal relationships, which is interrupted as they put on the sirens as they spot a crime in progress at a liquor store, and as they pull up their unit and pull out their weapons, they are shot at with a mighty shotgun and lose their first police vehicle of the day. This incident escalates into a hostage situation via the phones as Hill Street Station scrambles, and we see the terrified hostages being held at gunpoint as we are introduced to the kindly, soft-spoken liberal sergeant Henry Goldblum, the hostage negotiator, wearing a bow tie, as played by Joe Spano, trying to get a phone line into the liquor store by, despite the chaos all around him, being very polite to the operator from the phone company, who still makes him put ten cents into the payphone to connect him. Searching his pockets, he produces a baby's dummy, a pacifier, from his two-year-old, which is as neat an introduction to a character's backstory as you were ever likely to see. Meanwhile, Hill and Renko are helping with crowd control as the onlookers gather, causing undercover detectives JD and Washington to decide to hide their faces in case they're recognised by anyone. A pickpocket is working the crowds, and Belka notices this and begins to stalk him, prowling like the beast he appears to be. This pickpocket, played by Nick Savage, is destined to be regularly arrested by Mick Belker throughout the first four seasons, almost always giving a false name, but we'll come to that. On the phone, it turns out that the liquor store robbers are a couple of Hispanic juveniles, one of whom is called Hector, who are trying to call the media to tell their story. Henry breaks into their connection and they demand to speak to the warlord of the Los Diablos gang, Jesus Martinez, and hang up on Henry as he laments the difficulties in creating a calm ambiance under such circumstances. On the Ferrillo end of the connection, Lieutenant Howard Hunter, the ultra-right-wing head of their Special Weapons and Tactics Unit, or for legal purposes, no doubt, Emergency Action Team, played with just enough comic aplomb to make him likeable by James B. Sicking, later briefly a Starship Captain, overhears Frank speaking and, in another astonishing introduction using words like types, neutralize and example, persuades Frank to send his team over to the scene, as Frank has to remind him that they are not allowed to shoot anything without a direct order from himself. Frank Stay is about to take another turn for the worst as his ex-wife Faye, that played by the then wife of series creator Stephen Bochco, Barbara Bosson, turns up in a whirlwind flurry of fury talking about bounce checks and Frank Jr.'s fever and hate and Harvey, the child psychiatrist, and Frank Jr.'s gender identity thing and just how lousy Frank is. After this tour de force moment, whilst Frank laments just how much he misses his son, it falls to Phil Esterhouse to have a calming cup of coffee with Faye, in which we find out that his 23-year marriage broke up, and after ten bleak months in which he seriously considered ending it all, he's now dating a high school senior called Cindy. Meanwhile, 
Belka and his pickpocket share what was to become one of the defining routines for their characters as his one-fingered processing of the typewriter, a Richard T. Wilson, this week's false name included, is interrupted by a call from Hi, Mom, which tickles Mr. Wilson until Belka notices his mocking smile and shuts him up. Belka's 83-year-old father wants to go to Florida and his mother worries that he will want to have an affair. All this, and we're still not even halfway through this astonishing pilot episode. Frank and Faye manage to have a calmer discussion about their finances and their son, and whilst Frank is still concerned about the nature of her relationship with the boy Shrink, his 11 o'clock appointment arrives barging through the precinct doors with two bodyguards. It's Trinidad Silva as the diminutive Jesus Jesus Martinez, leader of Los Diablos, who certainly makes an impression, although Faye is less than impressed at who Frank's having a meeting with, and as the screen fades for the mid-episode break, implies that he's hardly living the big time. We return as two police officers reluctantly deliver lunch for their guests, and Sergeant Esterhouse savours the word detente that they teach him. The scene that follows is one of the quietest in the general mad frenzy of this episode and gives us a little more breathing space as the two sides negotiate while certain individuals are barely concealing their mutual contempt. Jesus demands weapons and Frillo counters with t-shirts, although they finally agree, can we live with that, on a police car transporting Jesus's mum to her weekly doctor's appointment. Sadly, none of this works out very well. After an impressive aerial shot of the chaos in the street outside the liquor store, Jesus negotiates with the boy Hector over a four-way party line, and when it is suggested that Hector and his pal might get away with being charged as juveniles, Howard Hunter interjects with some of his right-wing rhetoric, with Hector still listening in, and the situation predictably escalates not only in the liquor store, but also back at the precinct house, where the various face-offs lead to Frank trying to calm everything down and deciding to head out in person to the scene, whilst Ray impresses no one with his middle-aged man attempt at Spanish street lingo. JD and Washington are on the phones when we hear a fateful request to pull Hill and Renko off crowd duty at the liquor store to go and deal with a domestic disturbance. JD is practising his technique for how he plans to seduce. Joyce Davenport wants he to lured her back to the precinct with a false claim of having found her missing witness. Washington thinks he's crazy, but their play acting amuses the gathering crowd of Hill Street supporting artists anyway. Arriving at an apartment door, Renko puts the boot in to find a complicated family situation with a father sleeping with his stepdaughter because his wife isn't giving him the attention he thinks that he deserves. Bobby Hill negotiates a truce for this family and nobody is arrested. Which seems most dodgy under the circumstances, but Bobby lays down what he explains is now the law for this house and whilst it does seem extremely dodgy now, especially in its portrayal of the particular ethnic lifestyle in question, the male-female interaction in these families and the quasi-incestuous relationship that has been largely ignored, it does at least put a lid on a situation that was threatening to escalate out of control, and that, we learn here, is what policing has to be like in a district like Hill Street. As they leave, Renko's racism in that he'll never understand these people is overtaken by a far greater problem as their police car has been stolen from outside the apartment block and whilst Renko rants and rails about losing his second unit of the day and how Esther House is going to kill him, it is Bobby who can see the bigger picture that they are suddenly vulnerable and out of contact in a particularly hostile neighbourhood. Urging him to be cool as he discovers all of the payphones to be vandalised, they head off to find a telephone and enter a building only to interrupt another crime in progress and guns are drawn and the shots ring out as we fade to black. Well, my DVD does anyway. It being the Channel 4 release of Hill Street Blues Series 1, which uses the television edits that they broadcast. The original cut has them shot down in slow motion, which was deemed far too violent for viewers' eyes a couple of decades later. Fair enough, I might be tempted to cry, if at least part of those same cut scenes hadn't been included in the previously on Hill Street Blues recap montage at the beginning of the next episode. Sometimes the logic behind these decisions is breathtaking. As Renko and Hill lie bleeding out in an abandoned building with nobody knowing where they are there, Ferrillo arrives at the crowded street outside the liquor store with the levels of tension not being helped by the news helicopters hovering just above their heads. He has arrived at a scene of utter chaos, and as he grabs a megaphone and orders his people to holster their weapons, the only reply he gets to prove he can be heard is the symbolic throwing of a roll of toilet paper, and his fellow peace officers are not impressed at that. This really isn't Frank's day. 
But let's be honest, is it ever? The noise from the helicopters and the swirling dust and air they are causing really is not helping. And as Frank removes first his jacket, then his shoulder holster inside the shop, both the captors and the captives are starting to panic and the vibrations are causing the entire shop to shake. Hector and his pals smash the door glass and point their shotgun towards Frank as he approaches the shop uh, with his hands raised above his head whilst the police raise their own weapons again. This, this is gripping stuff, people, and so effectively done. Finally, the vibrations cause bottles to fall off the shelves and smash, which causes Howard's emergency action team to barge in and the subsequent eruption of firepower pretty much destroys the liquor store. Happily, the hostages have thrown themselves to the floor and Frank has managed to wrestle to the two delinquents to the ground so that nobody is killed in the barrage of gunfire this time. And whilst in the aftermath Frank is furious about pretty much everything, his mood is not helped by Henry suggesting that he take a Valium with Frank's job basically to try and keep control and order in a state of pure bedlam. It might take more than that. Meanwhile, in a beautifully played scene, Howard Hunter suggests to one of his team that they might want to look into the immigration status of one of the shop's owners as well, and as he taps out his pipe in what remains of the shop window frame, that collapses too. Back at the station house, Joyce has arrived to discover JD's little prank and scares him by telling him she's decided not to press charges and proceeds to pour hot coffee over his groin after he tries one last misplaced effort at flirting with her. Joyce departs, completely blanking a returning Frank, who then gets told off by Phil Esterhouse for taking that stupid risk he did by walking towards the shotgun earlier. Then, after telling him that he's had 40 calls, 25 of them from his ex-wife, and that Hill and Renko are missing, he just says, go home, Frank, because he can mind the store tonight, as Cindy is out at her marching practice. And for a normal TV cop show, that's where it might end, but Hill Street Blues has one last little surprise for us, which may come as no surprise to us now, of course, but was an astonishing twist when this episode first aired. We cut to Joyce in an apartment, ranting about her day, and when we discover just who the gentleman in her bed listening to all this is, we are gobsmacked, for despite all of the open hostility on display throughout the day, the chap who keeps Joyce warm at night is none other than Captain Francis Xavier Ferrillo himself. And despite the half Valium that Joyce herself has taken, they seem to be having a lot of fun together. Fade to black. Although, there's one last thread that is still dangling in this 44-minute masterpiece. Late at night, on the street, Belka and another patrolman finally find what appears to be the bodies of their colleagues in that empty building. And from the look on Mick's face, things do not look too good for officers Hill and Renko. Late at night, round at Joyce and Frank's place, his trousers are beeping. It's Sergeant Esterhouse on the phone, telling him that they've found the missing officers and they're both in intensive care and, finally, exhausted, we fade to black and the end titles roll, ending with the MTM cat wearing a police cap. Phew. That was exhausting, and it was only the pilot. This is all simply one typical day in the chaotic life of Hill Street Station, and there are going to be many more like it over the next seven years. 145 more episodes will follow after this, and, to be honest, the quality remained astonishingly high. Granted, the network executives didn't really like the unfolding narrative structure and would insist after a while that at least one storyline was concluded in every episode, and other production teams would come along and introduce new characters that they themselves preferred writing for, but on the whole, and with several more genuine shocks along the way, Hill Street Blues remained quality television throughout its run and did open the door to lots more series involving ensemble casts and rolling narratives that were almost unheard of before in this kind of series, and yet which are pretty much the norm nowadays, which is why Hill Street Blues genuinely seems to have changed the very nature of primetime television drama. Because before Hill Street Blues, apart from in the soap operas, both daytime and primetime, American cop drama especially was quite static and the villain of the week tended to be captured before the end of the episode. Some seeds had already been sown in series like Cagney and Lacey with their minor ongoing story arcs, but essentially they were still dealing with the story of the week with a little bit of continuance of life-changing events like pregnancy and alcoholism and unemployment having a continuing impact. A few years earlier, and one of the Starsky and Hutch team could become a heroin addict one week and it would have no impact upon any other episode 
episode of the series because it was believed that cop drama had to be self-contained so that the episodes could be run in any order once they made it into syndication. Apart from these rolling storylines and an ensemble cast, Hill Street also introduced other techniques to the mainstream like overlapping dialogue that you couldn't always hear clearly like in real life and cinema verite roving camera work never focusing too long on one particular thing but darting about much like the eye does. Stylistic touches that mean that the viewer are immediately part of the action. Right from the moment that the roll call caption appears at the start of the pilot, television drama was unlikely to ever be quite the same again. Hill Street Blues would spawn many offspring from the pen of Stephen Bochco, including hits like L.A. Law and NYPD Blue, amongst others, and shows like Homicide Life on the Street owe an awful lot to the pathways it opened up to. NYPD Blue would itself stretch the primetime comfort bubble a generation later, and may be at least partially responsible for the coming of HBO and ultimately services like Netflix, and the darkness, violence and blatant sexuality on display in shows like The Sopranos and Game of Thrones. Although the Leeds-based out of the blue which attempted to mimic the style of NYPD blue but in Leeds was less successful I feel but for me that opening hour of Hill Street Blues really does feel like the moment when everything changed forever Many thanks to Martin. Yes, thank you, Martin. We watched that first episode. We did. Didn't we? There's a lot going on. Indeed. It, there's a lot to process. So you've got the first series on yes, DVD? Yes, we've got the first series on DVD, and I've just found out the rest of the series, all of the series, yeah. are on all four, should we wish to watch more. All right, okay. So, yes. and, and we probably will at some point. We probably point. will, yeah. Right, next, uh, we go all transatlantic again. We do. As yeah. Paul and Toppy return to expand on their chat from last month mm -hmm. this time they're looking in depth at the wild wild west <laughs> Hello Round the Archives people, it's me again, Paul, Paul Chandler, or, or Shigetti if you prefer. Um, I, I'm back, and by popular demand, I have brought my old friend Toppy Smelly with me again. Hi Toppy. Yay, hi, hi Paul. Hey, <laughs> oh, it's good to talk to you. Well, um, do you want to tell the listeners what we're going to be talking about this time? We, we did kind of talk a little bit about it when we talked about Owen Allen and stuff but um, we, we um, thought there's more to be said isn't there well I think so this is one of my all time favorite television series from my youth <laughs> and uh, it was from the uh, late 60s and uh, started out in black and white switched to color it is the Wild Wild West with Robert Conrad and uh, Ross Martin in the in the leading roles. Yes, and as I was saying last time, it took me until very recently, you know, in the last two or three years, to finally see the series because if it was ever repeated on here, then I I missed it. And but I was aware of it, and I feel like I was aware of it. Nothing to do with. That film we won't mention. I, I just kind of knew it was one of those cult TV shows of the 60s. And I felt like I'd seen so many um, other shows. Uh, you know, Man from Uncle I'd seen. And Star Trek, obviously, and Invaders, and Owen Allen stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But not, not the Wild Wild West. Well, I did not see it when it was originally airing. Um, it was in heavy syndication here in the States mm. in the early 70s. And, and so uh, it used to be on every Saturday. or But I, uh, that's how I caught it. It was in syndication, and I, I loved it. I just loved the wild, wild west. I, I, I found it interesting. I read a little thing that said that the creator of the show, Michael, Michael Garrison, 
he described it as James Bond on horseback um, because it was around the time when westerns were maybe not as successful, but spies were really in. That's true. Westerns were kind of slowly edging out. Now, there was Gunsmoke on TV Mm. that at the time was like the longest running American TV show. And by God, it went right up into the early early 70s, Gunsmoke, before it stopped. So, but before, you know, in, in the early 60s, especially the 50s, American television had Westerns, 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 Westerns. And then, of course, came uh, James Bond and the Bond movies. And that really uh, made producers pay attention. Ah, spies. We have not mined that territory yet on television. And, of course, in the right around the time the Wild Wild West came out, a lot of spy TV shows came out. Men from Uncle. I Spy. Yeah, that's one that I've never seen either. I don't know how often that's been shown over here. Um, Yeah. Uh, You know, I Spy, now don't ask me why, that was not in syndication. Mm -hmm. I never saw that show. Now, why? why? I don't know, but it it wasn't syndicated, or at least not in my territory. And so it it would have it was years and years later that I finally laid my eyes on a couple episodes of I Spy, and that would be with Robert Culp and uh, Bill Cosby uh, mm. uh, in the late sixties. I Spy. Uh, uh, the other the other thing funny we talk about James Bond, of course, because Michael Garrison, um, who I think he produced like Peyton Place and An Affair to Remember, a Long Hot Summer, but. Um, he actually co-owned the rights to Ian Fleming's uh, first James Bond novel, Casino Royale, which is the kind of the one that never properly got made in the 60s. The, the comedy version got made, and it w- wasn't until Daniel Craig that there was a serious version of Casino Royale. But So he actually had some sort of, uh, Michael Garrison actually had some sort of proper connection with uh, the the James Bond stock. Oh, well. fascinating! I did not know that. Um, well, so there's a link right there. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's the other thing. I was looking um, before we started talking. The first season is just all over the place when it comes to producers. Um, because shall I t- shall I tell you what I've got here? I've got I haven't got this by by memory, but I think possibly because there were actually five people involved in the first. Um, season as far as producing and I think to a certain extent probably influence the type of episode you know they all had different ideas some of them wanted to be more conventional some of them wanted to be weirder and so we had you had Michael Garrison who did episode one you know because he owned it but the TV company they didn't want him to do a series I don't think they thought he was experienced enough in TV because he'd done movies Um, so then then Fred Freiberger was brought in and he did, um, he did a handful of episodes, sort of earlier ones. And but also, Collier Young, um, he did some. And then, I mean, there, there's there's lots of different reasons that I, I have. It's, if you want to know the full story, it's it's, it's on Wikipedia, folks. But it, it does sort of say. So I think Fred Freiberger was um, he sort of brought in the sort of beautiful women, women strong adversaries sort of bizarre plot lines he, yeah. he was responsible for that and he also um sort of brought in the character of Do- dr lovelace which i'm sure we'll come back to but um um but um but he got replaced and then someone called john mantley was involved someone called gina Jean l coon who produced about five episodes and then michael garrison came back right at the end hmm. uh, uh, gene Gene Alcoon was associated with the original Star Trek series. Uh, well, you know, I don't know the story of that, but as you say, it might be there on Wikipedia. What I do know is that there are characteristics to this show, and uh, and I really uh, like them. Now, let's just take, for instance, the uh, iconic uh, theme song. Mm. Uh, when you hear that theme song, nothing else like it. When you watch the credits um, uh, come by, it, it, they're animated. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, they have a the, which wasn't uncommon at that time. There were a lot of uh, it was something that was being done at that time, and um, uh, and uh, one of the things that I don't know I've uh, personally I've always loved is that they used the animation uh, that started the show um, at the break of every commercial so that um, there would typically be some sort of moment where somebody was in in peril, uh, you know, many little cliffhangers, and the screen would freeze and then uh, dissolve into an illustration of the scene. And then it would become part of this montage that we saw at the beginning of the show, which may not make any sense to <laughs> anyone as I'm describing it. But it was it was unique to the show and very much they used it from start to beginning mm -hmm. and uh, it just became this wonderful little characteristic piece of, of the show. Because um, unlike shows like uh, Lost in Space or even Land of the Giants uh, I'm sure there are others the, every, everything stays pretty much other than going to colour in season 2 the, the title sequence stays largely the same and you know, there's no big sort of change in the theme or, or the type of sequence or it's it, it's it, it stays pretty consistent uh, in its look um, yeah well, I don't know if you've ever noticed but the one thing that d does change there's one panel in the animated sequence where uh, a woman approaches uh, uh, James West and they embrace and they have a kiss and, and she brings up a dagger mm. uh, while she's kissing him. And the one thing that changed uh, at least a couple of times is what he did to her <laughs> yeah. and, uh, in the animated sequence. And at, at uh, one point, she, he just uh, punches her, right? And she lands uh, ass over tea kettle. Mm. Uh, but... Um, but they changed that little sequence uh, just, I guess, to amuse us, and uh, and it it didn't it didn't always have that. Yeah, it's funny because I I saw on a, I was looking at some episodes and things today. I saw somebody was accusing, oh look, the politically correct people have changed that, but sounds like it was not consistent in the actual series anyway. It wasn't always what was happening. So it's nothing that's been done recently. It's something no. that was no, done. No, no, no. But, uh, um, I think I think they were just playing around. Um, I can't think of any other reason. So they had this really iconic animated beginning. They had this cute bit they would do before they went into commercial where it related to that animated beginning. And then every episode, um, you could probably depend on uh, certain things happening. First of all, uh, a femme fatale, uh, and uh, second of all, at least one, mm -hmm. if not more, group fight scenes where James West would have to fight off, you know, seven people. Almost every episode that happened. Um, and also, uh, a villain, a weird mm -hmm. villain, and a weird plot, a, a MacGuffin, something that carried the plot along that really could have been just about anything, and they came up with a whole lot of things. I, I, I've seen it to sort of describe the style, it's sort of Western mixed with espionage and science fiction, uh, and sort of what they call steampunk in a way, like before it's before that was even used. Uh, as a sort of the mixture of the different um, genres, um. yeah, the steampunk aspect uh, is is something that just sort of became recognized years mm. and years later. But it had it, uh, yeah. and um, there's you know it's kind of uh, there's several episodes um, where it's used to good effect. Um, I remember one episode where uh, there was this submarine that was bashing ships in harbors, 
and um, it seemed to people that it was some sort of undersea monster, but uh, <laughs> it was really uh, just the submarine. And the submarine was very steampunk, kind of 20,000 leagues under the sea-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there were, uh, well, like I say, the plot lines were uh, very strange and science fictiony and uh, but it's actually set I, I see that it's set it, it's supposed to be during the administration of of ulysses grant president ulysses grant from about 1869 to 77 uh, that, yeah that. something like that it was definitely after the civil war and it wasn't they didn't call it the cia because it was way before that but what yeah. but it did have a name didn't it what yeah i'm not sure that i I, I know, but I'm also, you know, I know their sort of secret, uh, secret service. It, sec- maybe it was just they call it the secret service. Yeah, um, and of course, there's the other thing is that every episode is the night of. It, it, uh, <laughs> yes, the title was always preceded by the night of blah blah blah. blah. I think, um, I think should, should should we give the listeners a few examples? Shall I shall I read a few of the the weird titles out? Yeah, definitely. So we've got the the first episode is the night of the inferno. We've got the night of the deadly bed, uh, the night the wizard shook the earth, um, the night of the casual killer, the night of the glowing corpse, the night of the dancing dead, the night of the double edged knife, the, the night of the re- the red eyed madman. So yeah, so the titles are just really you know <laughs> all the way through the four seasons um, that they're. they're the, like the, the night of the eccentrics, the night of the golden cobra, um, they, they they draw you in. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, one of the things uh, the, the show kept from beginning to end was that uh, that our two heroes, Artemis Gordon and James West, were always on their private train, mm, that's right. and that's how they would uh, travel across the country, and um, and so that was their home was the the interior of this train and it was uh, uh nicely uh appointed and decorated and um and there were uh, they each had special skill sets right paul yes so artemis really not the uh, uh the per- the guy to do physical combat uh so artemis was the master of disguises and he was also clever with providing little gimmicks and um, it was it was his mind really uh, that was of value now James West Paul what was he good at fighting um, sort of being the pinup of the show <laughs> well no, it's not coincidental I mean you know uh, he had um, uh, what he wore was less like the above the waist coat and uh, really tight breeches. Mm-hmm. Uh, you couldn't help but notice it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he was the fighter. And, and just about every episode, you, you were guaranteed to see James West face off with about five opponents at one time. Well, I think they both got their share of the ladies. So it was reasonably well balanced, I think. <laughs> yeah. The damsel under stress is no damsel. She's quite a girl. Yeah, they uh, they were often in competition with uh, how they did with the ladies. Now, now um, there are like villains in in most episodes or guest stars, but there aren't that many recurring v- villains. Um, and the one that is recurring is mainly in the first two series because uh, was it because of ill health? Did he even die when the show was still running? Uh, Doctor Love, the actor that played Doctor Loveless. Yes, for whatever um, reason, he wasn't. He only did ten episodes, and they were pretty much in the first um, two seasons, I believe. Okay, uh, that very well could be. He did. He did pass away around that time, so that probably did put the kibosh on Doctor Loveless. But that Michael was Dun- Michael Dunn. Yes, he was a little person, and he he was this wonderful villain <laughs> that troubled the the two of them for many episodes and he was trippy he, uh, he was weird oh, Antoinette I really surpassed myself this time 
gone beyond the realms of imagination. Not even the great Da Vinci with his machines that fly could have dreamed of such a destructive weapon. And so tiny it fits in this little box. As pure as the driven snow. Oh, Miguelito, it's wonderful. It looks perfectly harmless. But once James West so much as inhales its aroma, he'll feel as if he's been trampled by a 20-mule team. And this time... We'll cut the infallible James West down to size. Oh, yes, Miguelito. And this time, he'll never get away from you. Ah, true. True. <laughs> In the very early episodes, he had a he had a sidekick who was played by Richard Keel, the, the guy who plays Jaws in the James Bond films. And, of course, he's very tall and uh, completely opposite. Mm-hmm. I don't think he was in... He wasn't in all of his episodes, but he was in the first few as his sidekick. Yeah, and he'd be paired up. Uh, I remember one, one, op- one great opening of uh, 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 of uh, the Wild Wild West before the uh, titles was um, this really huge woman. I mean, she was a big woman, and uh, and uh, as it went along, she just started laughing, and she had a suitcase. And she set the suitcase down on the table, uh, and and pulled out. In the suitcase was Doctor Loveless, mm-hmm. and she lifted him up and was still laughing. Uh, it, it it was strange. Now I don't know, but I feel like the the people that created Wild Wild West were really looking at. The UK's Avengers, mm. don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many of those shows sort of they almost fed into each other as well, or they kind of influenced each. Like we were saying last time about Batman influencing um, the Avengers, and then you couldn't, you weren't too sure at the time. And I sent you that clip where they were literally having a a, 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 a Zam Pow fight on the Avengers. So. Um, so I think yeah, I think I think they were, you know, everyone was trying. was almost stealing from each other in the same way as like sixties bands, like the Beatles would hear the Beach Boys, and the Beach Boys would copy the, and they they all copied each other. That was happening on TV as well as in music. Mm-hmm. There's one way you you can take these series, these action series from the late sixties. They all did this, all of them. Mm-hmm. There was a move that you could make when you were in combat was very fast and it was a karate chop that completely incapacitated your opponent just one blow delivered in a karate chop way decimated your opponent star trek did it wild wild west did it i spy did it mad from uncle did it oh All these shows of the late 60s, the hero would incapacitate someone with one karate blow. (laughs) Yeah, they they even had that in 70s Doctor Who. But there were so many, like, really famous people who played villains, or I guess they usually were villains. Uh, Victor Bueno, um, J.D. Cannon... Um, Now, I remember Victor Bueno. He, He returned a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, I think he played he played different characters, but uh, um, from what from what I what I read, because I I've sort of seen him in quite a few things over the years, and and uh, yeah, as you sort of explore new series, you realise how many different shows these actors were were in. Um, he, he's really good. Um, Leslie Nielsen was um, named. Well, he played uh, King Tut on um, on Bat on uh, Batman. Yeah, Martin Landau was in an episode. Burgess Meredith, oh Yvonne Craig, didn't she play Batwoman? That's just probably before, before um, uh, Batgirl. Sorry, didn't she play Cat Batgirl? I think uh, so. Yeah. And Boris Karloff was in an episode. Wow. Uh, William Wyndham, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Ed Begley, uh, Ricardo Montalban. Oh yes. Uh, Yes, I think um, Victor Bueno was in possibly three episodes. Two, two, two episodes, like one episode 
right at the start. I think he was in the pilot episode, and then he played this character called Count Manzeppi. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, he, mm-hmm. he was in the show. Oh, John Astin was in it from um, from the Adams Family. Now Agnes Moorhead, I know, was in an episode because um, I was watching that earlier. Uh, well, she's from Bewitched. Uh, I I, uh, I like her, but yeah. There were there were so, so many sort of well known names and probably names that oh Kevin McCarthy he he was he was in Invasion of the Body Snatchers um, yep at, uh, so I was watching one uh, from the first season again um, because as I say it took me a long time to catch up with the show or to find a source of it it was very briefly on. On YouTube, it is in its complete form every episode. But I noticed the other day that's, I think they've been cracking down on things, and um, and I, but I did see it repeated on a sort of old gold channel, and then I I bought the DVD set. But um, I was watching one from the first season called The Night of the Puppeteer, where um, they literally sort of have um, um, sort of life size marionettes. I think I think they're actual people who are being manipulated like um uh like puppets that that was um that was quite quite creepy um yeah it had a, a very creepy feel to it do you have any particular ones that you that you remember that that, uh, that you particularly enjoyed the stories of well i can say that um definitely every time dr loveless was on you just sort of felt like okay here we go this is going to be good i was looking at um, the the episode guide, and it said that the third season uh, sort of shifted away a bit from fantasy, and more sort of I don't know the the villains being more political and less outrageous. But um, I, I, when I watched them, I don't know if I really was aware of that. I, th- I thought it just kind of kept sort of being but i guess if it i, I think i i didn't necessarily watch them in season order so maybe if that was the case then i wasn't quite so um mm-hmm. if i had to guess um batman was particularly outrageous mm. and it garnered a huge audience and then lost it pretty much as fast mm. as it gained it and it could be that when they saw how fast Batman ran out of gas, they said, ooh, let's not go down the same path. And uh, and maybe they put the brakes on the camp. Yeah, because by the third season, we're talking about um, late 67 into 68, by which point Batman was finished by, by 68, wasn't it? I would have, I would have thought, or oh, near enough. Um, but um, oh, I'll have a fact here. For you, um, there's an episode in season three, which um, is called "The Night of the Undead," and it is the episode. It says the episode is notable for featuring the most fight sequences in an episode, a grand total of seven fight sequences. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. so, so I know a little bit about the fight sequences in that Robert Conrad was really aware that he carried the show he carried the series and he took it very seriously and he wanted the fight sequences which were virtually in every episode he wanted them to be good Mm -hmm. and one way he prepared for them and was able to do them week to week was that he would have the same stuntmen every week so all those people that you would see gang up on um, uh, West uh, every every week, they were the same stuntmen, and um, and they got used to each other, and they were able to quickly choreograph a, a sequence uh, week after week. And Conrad like was really conscious of of how important that was. That um, that they be good, that they be different week to week. Something might be different, and um, 
So it was a major part. Every week when they put out one of these shows, the fight sequences were like a major part of the production. And they got through it because they used the same stunt people over and over. Mm. But I read something about in the fourth season, he hadn't, um, um, that, um, that, that Ross Martin had an, an accident um, during the filming of an episode and got a hairline fracture in his shin and then actually missed nine episodes. And I, I'm not sure if I've seen these, like these late, very late ones. Um, yeah. He, he had some, extra, um, so James West sort of operates solo, but then he also has some different agents um, as his sidekicks to cover those other episodes and the other eight episodes. Yeah. They would write in um, some, other characters to um, be in the show. And they they did a pretty good job, as I recall. I remember at least one person that partnered up uh, with Robert Conrad was a woman. Mm-hmm. Could not tell you who the mm-hmm. actress was, mm-hmm. but that was really different. And it, it was, they handled it rather comedically. Mm-hmm. In fact, well, that was mostly Ross Martin's part of the show mm-hmm. was to bring yeah. the comedy relief so when he was um off of those episodes the other people they brought in were also for comic relief i was quite surprised to read that um when the show was cancelled in 69 it it still had high ratings but it it apparently says it it was cancelled um as a concession to congress over television violence which um was a problem at the time, or considered it was considered one of the examples of of, of a show that was too violent. Um, mm. um, if was, that's true, it must have been a network decision mm-hmm. um, uh, to to sacrifice a show like that. If it was still making money, yeah. still getting ratings. Oh gosh, it, say, it says uh, that. Um, Ross Martin also had a heart attack during that last season as well, so he wasn't in a good way. What with the the the, fra- the hairline fracture as well. Um, yeah, and I I do remember him being written out of many episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, that may have also contributed to um, just the decision to yeah. okay, maybe yeah. we need to stop. As I was saying to you earlier, when I was kind of looking at clips and things before we started recording, I um, um, I, I did for the first time see some uh, footage from these two television movies, um, the Wild Wild West Revisited in yeah. May '79. I didn't realise, but they had Doctor Lovelace's like son because he's Doctor Lovelace Junior, and he's okay. played by Paul Williams. Ah, ah, ah. That fits so well. You know, I know uh, damn well I saw those reunion episodes. Uh, I remember virtually nothing about them, but it fits so well that, that he would have been uh, in there. You know, to do with an atomic bomb and replacing the crowned heads of England, of Spain, and Russia with exact duplicates who are under his control. <laughs> That uh, pretty much sounds uh, like it. So, the second television movie, apparently the first one was really successful, and they did a second one um, with uh, Victor Bueno, but I think he was playing a different character. He wasn't playing either of the characters he played before. The main villain was played by Jonathan Winters, who had ah. been, I think he'd been in the later seasons of Mork and Mindy, hadn't he? Um, yes. This, this, this is from October 1980. Um and, and it's all about um, he, um, Jonathan Winters plays a character called Professor Albert Paradine the second, a brilliant madman who seeks world power with weapons of doom. Sounds slightly similar. I think he might be in power in your country at the moment. But there we go. <laughs> um, but, I do. Um, I do remember when those reunion episodes came around. They were like, uh, I just know. I certainly had to see him, and I'm sure a lot of other people did too, because by that time, the Wild Wild West was sort of out of the syndication circuit, and none of us had seen it for a couple, three, four years. Mm. 
and uh, the reunion episodes came around, and it was like must must see TV. Yeah, part of the um, part of the second one was shown in two parts, but it wasn't as popular. But I think apparently the television movies were more humorous; um, they played more for comedy than the the original series. But um, mm-hmm. um, there's a recurring character in both of them who I only mention because of his connection to Star Trek. Unfortunately, um, you may have to help me with the pronunciation. René Aubergeonois, how do you, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> well, you almost had it, but don't ask me to pronounce it either. Anyways, he played <laughs> um, on uh, Deep Space Nine. He yeah. was the character who was a shapeshifter. Yes, hasn't he recently died? He did just pass away, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, he plays a recurring character called Captain Sir David Edney. So, um, oh, he's oh, he's well, it says he's play, he plays Colonel Sir David Edney in the second one, so he's gone from captain to colonel. I don't know, this could be wrong, who knows? But anyway, uh, he, he's in both, he's in both of them anyway. But, uh, and uh, just to briefly mention, uh, uh like two decades later, mm-hmm. They did a, t- uh, a a theatrical release movie, which I can give credit for maybe a couple of things. One was not a bad idea to have Will Smith uh, be James West. Mm. Uh, it worked, and he was certainly a very popular actor at that time. Mm. Um, and um, uh, it also really, really played up the steampunk aspect of it um and of course by that time there was cgi and they could do just about anything and um uh, so the uh, the visuals were interesting but really it just it just wasn't the wild wild west yeah well i think we have probably run out of time. There's, there's so much. I mean, with, with a series as many episodes as this, it's, well, I did think about, about about picking one or two episodes, but then you don't really kind of get to talk about the different things in the series or the different. Um, so, uh, but it's definitely worth a series worth checking out, particularly in the UK where I don't think it's half as well known, um, and uh, I've certainly enjoyed finally getting to see it because it's one I definitely wanted to see for many years. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. Uh, uh, villains were weird. Uh, plots were, uh, you know, somewhat uh, well intricate. But whatever it was, if, if you think of uh, the UK's Avengers, um, they certainly uh, style wise have a lot in common uh especially with the mrs peel era episodes and it's fun so. just seeing all the different special guests that you recognize um sort of turning up as villain of the week and uh this is the end of the rainbow for the illustrious james west and artemis gordon no there'll be no pot of gold waiting for you only a bucket of blood yeah, well, um, around the archives, listeners, we, we're going to have to go, I'm afraid. But thank you for listening. Um, do, do you want to give Do you want to give a plug to shows that you're involved in, other than other than this one, Toppy? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, you can catch me on the Smellcast, uh, which uh, you can find at thesmellcast.com, and also I'm involved in a uh, little movie trivia show called Matinee Minutia. And you can find that over at uh, mattnamenusha.wordpress.com. Uh, and uh, that's about it. And, and, and I'm on the Shy Life podcast. And so is Toppy sometimes too. So and that's <laughs> my plug. <laughs> and I'll be here. I'll be here next month probably as well. Um, and, and actually, Toppy, you're working on you're working on your your, your debut so, solo article from around the archives. I coming, am coming later this year. Yes. Right, let's go. We've got to go. We've got to go and record some silliness for the Shy Life podcast. Yes, yes. Have fun, you two. Pussycat will be here to make sure that you behave yourself.
Many thanks to Paul and Toppy. Yes, thank you, boys. Another interesting article. We should plug uh, episode 312 of the Shy Life podcast, which mm-hmm. is just out. Yes. Shy Yeti and the Fake Beasts of Old Loch Ness. Okay. Because uh, we star on that, talking about mythical beasts. We do. We do. And yes. that was recorded a while ago. It was. Uh, I don't have much sort of info on the Wild Wild West. We no. Do, we do have the fantastic television book. Mm-hmm. Uh, by Gary Girani and Paul H. Shulman, mm-hmm. which is, I believe, an, Amer- an American tome. Mm-hmm. And it's got a couple of bits on the Wild Wild West. And I, I was just mm-hmm. intrigued by the language they use. Okay. Its magic formula was a combination of strange and often kinky but fascinating villains and sophisticated technology somehow made plausible in the show's 19th century setting. And then there's a picture. Mm. And it says... Uh, Burgess Meredith was one of the kinky villains featured on the Wild Wild West. Is it really that kinky? From the small bits I've seen of it, no. It's odd. Yeah. And a little bit peculiar. Maybe I've got a different idea of what kinky is. Yes. I don't know. Maybe that it, it's not meant in the way that we think of. Yeah. Mm. But to round off mm-hmm. now, uh, Warren will join us on the sofa yes. as we present a tribute to Terry Jones yes. looking at... Medieval Lives. <laughs> Good evening, Warren. Greetings and salutations to you both. Good evening, Warren. Good evening, Lisa. We're here tonight mm-hmm. to talk about Mr. Terry Jones, yes. aren't we? Oh, the absolutely. legend. Yes, absolutely. And you wrote us a lovely piece for the blog. You did. Thank you very much. Yes. Why did you want to write about Terry Jones, though? I think he's the funniest of the pythons. Right. And I also think he is quite forgotten about his other works as well. Right some of which we're going to go on to shortly. Yeah. And I think he's just so effervescently funny. He's naturally funny in his delivery, and he has that wicked glint in his eye, doesn't he? Yeah. And and it's difficult not to like Terry. He has that likeable quality. It's rather that... It's rather, rather. That's why I can see him and Michael getting on so well. Yeah, they both have that wonderful, warm, likable quality. Well, Lisa, mm-hmm. you said to me that yeah. uh, Michael Palin and Terry Jones are the two you'd like to go down with the pub with. Yes, they're the two I think would be most fun. Yeah, you could go down the pub and have a good talk about history and travel and all that sort of stuff. And, and beer. And beer, because <laughs> Terry liked his beer. Yeah. So yeah, I just think they're the ones you'd feel most comfortable with mm-hmm. sitting in the pub. Now, I think there are other people better qualified than us to talk about Monty Python, mm-hmm. which is why I didn't want to do Python yes. as the tribute piece. Mm-hmm. And although we have got some of his earlier work, yeah. I wanted to actually concentrate tonight on his mm-hmm. love of history yes. that you've mentioned, which is why when his death was announced, my instant reaction was... Let's do medieval lives. Yes. Now, I I fully admit I love a bit of medieval. You do love a bit of medieval, yeah. yeah. If, if yeah. I read a history book, mm-hmm. I tend to go for the medieval period. You do. I just yes. find that very interesting. Mm-hmm. You, I think, Lisa, are a little bit later in yeah, your favourite period. I tend to read stuff from... Well, I do like medieval stuff, mm. but my interest go, goes more, more in the Tudor... Yeah. Um, sort of Stuart George onto the Victorian era because yeah. it's so close to our own. But the medieval era is a fascinating time because it covers such a huge period of time. Mm. You know, from from the Norman Conquest right up to the sort of um, Battle of Bosworth Field. Yeah. Now, so, do, you, do you know much about medieval period, Warren? Do you, do you know where you are with I don't. Society at this point. No, I don't. I'm very much an Industrial Revolution, um, early 20th century man. Right. So, no, my knowledge of medieval England is very scratchy. Yeah. Um, and that's why I love the fact. I had, I'd never seen this series before no. that we, we looked at. This is from 2004, and I remember yeah. seeing it at the time and enjoying it. And around about this time, there were actually quite a few history 
presenters on the air, weren't yes. they? Or history based mm. programmes. Yeah. It started to get more at this point. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. your Simon Sharmas and. Uh... Yeah, yeah Simon Sharmamamama <laughs> and, <laughs> and your David Starkey. Yes. But you've also got Time Team going. Yeah. And you've got Adam Hart Davis as yes. well. Yes. Oh, I love Adam Hart Davis. Yeah. Adam Hart Davis and Terry Jones are the sort of yeah. two most and, fun. And, and you've got Andrew Marr as well, yeah. haven't you? Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Terry, I think, well, we know that he knows his stuff. Yeah. But he's also got the technique of engaging the viewer, I think, mm-hmm. in getting his enthusiasm across. Yes. Because you notice there's an awful lot of walking through fields, yeah. waving his arms about, yeah. which is a classic... TV history presenter stance, isn't it? I, mm-hmm. I, I think he's quite mocking of the TV yeah. presenter as well. And also, he's he doesn't talk down to his audience. No. He doesn't belittle his audience. And he doesn't say, I know all this information. I'm going to impart it to you because you haven't got a, uh, you, you haven't got a scooby of what I'm about to tell you. But it's not that. It's, it's, it's I want to share it with you. I want yeah. you to be part of this journey rather than that I'm going to... Um, I'm just going to tell you loads and loads of facts. I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to envelop you into what the actual circumstances we're going to look at. And he's not afraid of making himself look silly in there. No, no he's definitely no, no. not. No. Or dressing up. No. He or loves fr- dressing up, or doesn't he? Or frankly yeah. getting covered in shite. Yes, yes. yes. I'm, we, not, I'm sure it wasn't shite. But, well, uh, I, I, was it the comment I made to you that uh, when, when, the, was it, when the horse goes past? Yeah. How yeah. the hell did the horse project that much? Yeah. Well, the first episode we watched was Peasant. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's be honest here. If mm. we lived in medieval times, yeah. I think we would be the peasants, we would. wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ye old podcast we'd be doing. Yeah, yeah, the peasant podcast. But even the title sequence of this, uh, you can tell that when it comes to the animation, and there's a lot of animation in this, yeah. in this mm. series, they're very much going for the sort of Terry Gilliam Python look. Mm-hmm. Mm, I, I, I don't. I don't get that. I get it. he he stamped his own uh, mark on this. I think all rather right. than going for the Gillingham, because it's um, it's all very structured. Whereas Gillingham is quite random, mm. and he takes bits of artwork and works with them. Yeah. Whereas this is structured and created from scratch. And it wouldn't surprise me if he says, "Well, I want them doing this, and I want this little bit yeah. character over here." So I didn't get that feeling. But the, well, I don't know how much say he has about the animation. Yeah. I really don't know what the sort of production. Do you think he said, I don't want this python. I don't want it to turn into silliness. I I want it to be humorous because people will always remember humorous situations, but I don't want it to turn silly. Well, uh, we should should also say a huge thank you to Martin. Yes. For his cover for this issue. Wonderful cover. Beautiful cover. Which which gets the medieval style absolutely perfect. (laughs) I got a crown. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot of talk about the feudal system and how you have your lord of the manor and Mm -hmm. the peasants. Yeah. And, Warren, you've lived in a village. Yeah. yeah. I'd class myself as the peasants in and, the village. Yeah. And so, so have I. And I think people don't perhaps realise, when it comes to certain areas of the country, how much that feudal system, there's still echoes of it oh, absolutely. today. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, um, when, when we grew up, it yeah. was very much like that, but with electricity. Yeah. And that was the only difference, wasn't it? Well, the structure is that one person essentially owns the village, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and the land around it, and the people who live on the land. Yeah, and you are expected to say, my lord, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yeah, it's almost, uh, it's almost it, well, it stopped at doffing your forelocks, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But especially among the sort of older generation, I think, there, you know, that there is very little difference between sort of the medieval period and... Not long ago, frankly. No, no absolutely. I, I'm interested, Lisa. Mm-hmm. You probably weren't aware of this when you came to, no, to, to no. sort of the, our villages, were no. you? Were you surprised how it, it was, how uh, it worked? It was a little bit odd because I think the first time I encountered it, there was a, I think it was the meeting to try and save the post office, mm. and um, the Dowager Lady Shaftesbury yeah. was there, and I only called her that because she wasn't the wife of the current Lord Shaftesbury. Yeah. I don't think. Or they were divorced or, or mm. whatever. But they everybody was calling her my lady and it comes across as slightly weird. Well, I was thinking about this. Um you know that, that sketch, I look up to him yes. and I look down on him. I and you've got the th- you've yeah. got the three figures, haven't you? You you've got Cleese, Barker and Corbett meant meant to represent the three classes. classes. Yeah. And I always think village life is like that sketch. 
Except you're, you'd have somebody even taller than John Cleese and somebody shorter than Ronnie Corbyn. Yeah. And, no, really, and the, t- yeah. the tallest one would be the lord of the village and the shortest one would be the, the people that work, know, on, the land, work yeah. on the land. Absolutely. So it, it, I, I must admit, it, it, it might do weird things to your head. I don't know whether... It, no, yeah. Rural Dorset really hasn't changed that yeah. much in the last three to four hundred years. No. Yeah, it's just interesting, though, because we, we visit um, the village of Laxton in Nottinghamshire, where they've got the court leet going on, haven't they? And the farmers <laughs> are there on jury day. Mm. And there's the the dreadful crime of a stray piece of turf on the <laughs> common ground. A sod is sodded off. Yeah. <laughs> and this is apparently known as shoveling in. Shuffling something. Yeah. And they come to the conclusion this is a very serious offence and could cost anything up to two pounds in a fine. But I'd like to point out here that all these so called people who work on the land or what they were classed as peasants yeah. were all wearing barber jackets and flat well, cap, well, that, tree the, caps that's and the things. Thing. Isn't these they? are farmers that own their farm. Yeah. My family comes from the class that would work on the farm but wouldn't own it. Mm. That's the thing. And we, we should and the draw, same, same we should mine, draw yeah. the distinction between, you know, the green welly farmer and the person that, you know, d- does the actual work, if yeah. you see The labourer. I mean. The yeah. labourer. Yeah. So in yeah. cat weasel terms, it's the mm. difference between Charles Tingle's character yeah. and Neil McCarthy's character. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm very much from Neil McCarthy's yeah. class. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, you know, farmers that actually own their farms are, to me, posh. Yes, and, yeah. in, and to me too, yeah. yeah. In medieval terms, mm. so that they're like the middle ground, aren't yeah. they? They're like the Shreve. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Reeve. Yeah, Reeve, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But they, they have their meeting down the pub <laughs> to, to, to work out what the fine's going to be. And the Lord of the Manor's there. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. And you can tell he's the Lord of the Manor because he's the only one wearing a tie. Not yeah. covered in <laughs> and not covered in mud. <laughs> yes. But, but you actually get the, get the oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah uh, stuff, uh, don't um, you? And yeah. that's just that's the seal. That's the seal, isn't it? To say I'm in charge. Whatever whatever I say goes. Yeah. And uh, here is this piece of paper that enshrines it in law. Yeah. But then there's the the talk of the village um, in medieval times, who the king was going to pass through their village, and um, if the king did that, <laughs> that was brilliant. Wasn't it, it became a king's highway, and, and it could therefore be taxed. Tax. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole village pretended it's to be mad. mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been to some villages, <coughs> well, frankly, where there's not much acting required for no, that. No, yes. Yeah. It yeah. Did, but it just made me think of the bit in in high, the pilot episode of Heidi High where they're trying to stop people coming into the carriage and, and Ted says, act peculiar. Act peculiar, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this is um, so talk about feudal burden where the, the sort of the serfs would have to work 50 or 60 days for their lord. Yeah. And then the rest of it was their own. But as Terry points out, with taxes being the way they are today, most people have to work 80 days to pay off the tax man before, yeah. you know, they're, they're actually making their own money. So things are, in some ways, worse. worse. than they worse. Were now. Yeah. 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 Then we visit some uh, typical peasant houses, don't we? <laughs> and as you said, the first one is... is it's actually quite a big house. There's mm, just yeah. not much in it. Yeah. No. But the second one for the Reeve, mm. you, he's posh because he's got a Welsh dresser. Mm-hmm. And jugs. And, and he, hang, jugs, yes. Nice, and, nice pair of jugs on the and, dresser. And his, his wife is, is very keen to show off her jugs to all in Absolutely. sundry, isn't yeah. she? They're very, you know? they're very well decorated, I thought, her jugs were. Mm-hmm. But, but then, then Terry's on to a subject he clearly loves, and I know he does. Yeah. Beer. 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 Yeah. Now, we should point out at this point that everybody including children, mm. drunk beer. Yeah. Because the water wasn't safe to drink, so everybody drunk um, beer, but it was small beer, which yeah. meant it was really, really weedy. Yeah. There was hardly any alcohol and in it this at all. this particular place had a problem with its head rising, didn't it? Oh, this, that's, this, a, that's, this, a, that's a bit later, later, yes, later yeah. episode. Uh, but you, you can flavour your beer with things like bog myrtle yes. and things like that. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I don't think I'm going to try it now. But one of the highlights of the medieval period is, of course, the Black Death. <laughs> well, you say highlights. <laughs> the main star of the... Yeah. 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 
but it means that the population halves. And the workers get more... Well, they don't get more rights, but they get... Empowered. Empowered, because they can negotiate for more money. But the lords of the manor are not keen on the peasants getting above themselves, are are they? Nothing much has changed. And I was going to say, yeah, nothing, nothing much changes. And laws are brought in about what you can wear... Mm. On your cl- on your sort of class of society, yeah, you can't have shoes that are too long, for example, or too pointy, or too pointy, yeah, pointy shoes. Mm. But I was I was keen to do more than this first episode because mm. there were eight episodes in total, and I mm-hmm. wanted to sort of get you a good feel for these for mm. this whole series. Good feel. Um, so I wanted one that was relevant to you, Lisa, yeah, and one that was relevant to Warren as well. <laughs> So for Lisa, we chose damsel. I'm not sure how relevant it is, but. Uh... but Do you guess... feel in distress? <laughs> Are you locked in tall towers? No. Do you have long flowing golden locks? No. You'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but again, um, Terry has has an argument all the way through here that what we think we know about the medieval period we is, don't know is yeah. not necessarily true mm. and is often an invention mm-hmm. of, of, of other people for various purposes and yeah. that's the wonderful thing now he's got the hook hasn't he mm. he's thrown the line out and we've got the hook for the audience and that's wonderfully done because he's basically saying to you do you know that time you spelt in school that you really hated sitting in all those history classes well you were lied to yeah and he goes, and then goes subsequently and gently educates you in a period which would have taken probably a year at school. And in a fun way. Yeah, and in yeah. a fun way in 25 minutes. Well, that's the thing. At school, I never enjoyed history lessons and I gave them up as soon as I could. Who was your English teacher of interest? Mr. Tamplin? Uh, I can't remember. English. Well, yeah. okay. um, English. English. I, honestly history, can't remem- yeah. I honestly can't remember. Okay. That's how much impact it made on me. <laughs> Um, I seem to remember mostly colouring in maps about World War One, but never mind. Um, maps aren't history. I know, but my love of history has come later in my life, yeah. and it, it is through people that enthuse you about it. So, mm-hmm. and I include Terry in that. Yeah, and horrible histories does a wonderful yeah. job yeah. of that. But he, he doesn't pass up the opportunity to dress up as a damsel, does he? No, <laughs> as he plays the knight who effectively comes to rescue himself, yes, or herself. Mm. What do you think of him as a damsel, Warren? Disturbing. Okay. <laughs> and then we get a story done with medieval puppets. Yeah. About a man and a woman who wanted their daughter's uh, sort of virtue to be taken, shall we mm, say. To get in with the to local... Get, get with the flower local, to be harvested. With, yes. with yeah. the local bishop. Local Norman bishop. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. wanted her as his mistress and obviously he couldn't do that. So he, they were going to marry her off to somebody. And then he just have her as his mistress every time he wanted to. Yeah. Bishop. Oh, so the oh dear, they're bashing the bishop then. <laughs> but what do you think of those puppets? They were. I think that was a lovely way of suddenly going. This has gone left field. Mm. Where's this going to go? But you're going to remember that, aren't you? Yeah. And it was almost Punch and Judyish puppets, wasn't they it? They were Punch and Judyish. Yeah. 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 Then we get the thing that uh, women didn't wear traffic cones on their heads. No. no. I suppose yeah. there weren't much call for traffic cones in those days. And and we see how sort of ladies' sort of clothes denote their station as well. Yes. And, uh, um, with various sort of... Uh, embellishments. I, I, I couldn't see any embellishments, <laughs> could you, Warren? No, they were well covered by okay. the accoutrements. Yeah. I like the idea as well that there was this... I can't remember the... the which one, what the lady was called, but there was one where who slashed her outer garment. So you could see her so inner one. So you could see oh, the, yes. the luxurious material I, underneath. I think she was a wanton yeah. hussy for doing that. You couldn't see anything else, but you'd see know, like the silk underneath it. Possible bit of ankle. Yeah. And, and let's, uh, let's talk about um, St George slaying the dragon and oh. is it equating St George with chastity. He's got yes. lady parts on him, hasn't he, the dragon? And the dragon with yeah. loose ladies. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Be- because... Uh, ladies are part of the downfall of man, aren't they? Lisa? Yes. Well, Eve took the apple from the snake, so yeah. you know. Yeah, it's all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. It's David Tennant's fault. He was the snake. Was he? Yeah, in Good Omens. He's he's the ah. he's the snake. Oh yes, he is, isn't yeah. he? Yes, so yes. Crawley. Then we moved on to outlaw mm-hmm. for Warren. Yes. For medieval crime and punishment. Yes. Maybe sound like a criminal. <laughs> no, you're just you're a you're a. Beacon of the law, aren't you? A beacon. I think it's usually a bee that they call me, but it's not a beacon, no. <laughs> and there's talk of the Folville gang, who are mm. an aristocratic band of brothers. Mm. Who are Literally. Like, do you, do you imagine the, the anthill mob, but they're hanging off the side of a cart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And there's a thing that you become an outlaw by failing to turn up for your trial. And a lot of people became outlaws, yeah. didn't they? Terry's wandering around in the neighbourhood watch area at one point. I, I like the, the <laughs> Dodgy curtains. curtains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, Terry watching himself, wasn't he? Yeah. And if you caused injury to somebody... It, it was there was a price for everything it depended yes. what it was wasn't it it's very much like the uh, criminal compensatory board that we have now yeah. for the amount of money you'll have for <laughs> losing an eye or an arm or a leg six shillings for a nose and your front teeth are six shillings <laughs> and the further back in your mouth are the, the cheaper it gets the cheaper the teeth are yeah, yeah. There's a talk about trial by fighting with ram's horns <laughs> <laughs> trial by combat it yes. starts off at but then again they didn't give them Knives or swords. They give them ram's horns. They give them a ram's Which horn, then broke. Which yeah. broke. And, and then, then they, they had to bite each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> somebody bought, bit somebody in a particularly embarrassing place. On the they? member. On I the believe. member. Yes. Yeah. Or close to it, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I was just thinking of the fish slapping dance at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing about trial by jury, you would be tried by people that knew you <laughs> as well. That's, yes. that's a weird one. Mm. Yeah. And a dispute over hedge clippings. <laughs> yes! <laughs> You had yeah. a high hedge on their property yeah. and somebody clipped some clippings into your land. Yeah. If you if you went to prison, though, you'd have different levels of comfort depending on how much money First, you had. First, second and third class. Yeah, yes. and you, you could live with the jailer if you wanted. Yes, in the en suite upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. But that very, mu- very much didn't change because in the sort of Tudor times, if you had money, you could get a better cell. Yeah. So... Uh, there's, there's a guillotine before it was called a guillotine. Can't yeah. call it a guillotine. Yeah, he, he hasn't come along and it's used a falling the blade yet, machine, which could I, be operated by like a cow. Or yeah, a I horse. like that idea. Oh, like yeah, if you stow a cow or no. a horse, they tie a, a sort of bit of rope to the cow and tie the other end to the pin, and then hit. hit mm. Well, he'd whip the cow, but whatever, and then the cow would run and it would pull the pin out, come and the blade along, would Daisy. fall. <laughs> and then we see Terry running for sanctuary to to, to Beverly. <laughs> By, yes. by a bad CSO. It's like running over the county line, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if you get to a certain stone... Yeah, they can't... Then, uh, then you're safe. You're safe. What was it he said? Uh, but um, they might kill you if you... What happens if they kill you by the stone? Because there'd be no witnesses. Yeah. And if you were... You, you had to demonstrate that you were willing to leave the country as well by going for a paddle. Yeah, if you could oh, yes. Yeah, because they... You, you got 40-day sanctuary, mm. and after that you'd have to leave the country. Unless you were in Beverly, where you could get lifelong sanctuary. Yeah. But, yeah, so you'd have to go and find a boat. And, so, like, somebody got, um, so, was it three weeks to go from somewhere yeah. to Portsmouth and somebody else got three days. Yeah. And you'd get, if you got there and there was no boat available, you'd have to walk into the sea every day to, to show that you were willing to leave. But Terry t- it takes his trousers off yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any excuse. Mm. Uh, then on to Kings. Mm-hmm. This is the one I, one of the ones I find most interesting because yeah. it subverts mm. what you think about different kings. There's Absolutely. three King Richards. Yes. And one of them's good and one of them's bad and one of them's ugly. Yes. Or at least that's the way we think. Yes. Um, and, and, yeah, Terry argues that, again, yes. that what we think is, is probably wrong. Yes. I, I like the thing about uh, Richard I. You said he'd sell London. If sell he, London if, if you could find a buyer. Yes. And I always think there's a great alternative history novel there. Yeah. Or a great sort of Doctor Who... Um, parallel world story yeah. there. Well, they sold it's London. That London it was, to the French or yeah, something. That yeah. London was sold and it becomes its own country inside England. Oh, it's a bit like Passport to yeah. Pimlico here. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Burgundy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So yeah. I, I just think somebody, somebody should do something yeah. with that with that idea. Yeah, come on, big finish. Um, there's there's talk about using a frying pan as a shield as well. <laughs> <That's> very <laughs> silly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a wonderful... Uh, mm. and, and you laughed at that, Warren, and I just wrote down... Uh, when you look at the details of history, there is actually a lot of comedy, yeah. which yeah. is why yeah. Terry is a great, great presenter for yes, this. Yes, because he can bring that comedy out, can't yeah. he? Yeah. But yeah, you're a good king, basically. If you're the, a good king. You're a good king, You're basically. a good king. <laughs> it, I said I was a peasant. If the monks <laughs> write nice things about you. Yeah. And it's that thing, not just that history is written by the winners, yeah. but people's opinion of you is what survives in the documents. But it's, mm-hmm. it's also a dangerous thing, isn't it? Because it can be reflected on personal opinion if you're yeah. the monk scribing away, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Or the, you know, uh, royalty haven't given you your tax break or anything or bought your flat-headed beer. 
But Terry's doing a brilliant impression of Richard the Third. Yes. <laughs> and you said pure ham, didn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you got all the stuff about the princes yes. in the yes. tower. Yes. And do you know any? Do you want to add any more about that? Well, reason? nobody. Obviously, nobody will ever know who killed the princes in the tower. It could have been Richard the Third. It could have been Henry the Seventh. Yeah. There is no way of knowing because nobody that was there is obviously alive to tell. But, you know, I don't know if Richard III killed them. I, I think mean, it's a bit of a stitch up. Yeah. I think they're trying to stitch up Richard III. But the thing I found interesting is is um, Terry mentioned the thing about uh, the portrait of Richard III with one shoulder higher than mm, the other. Yeah. If you x-ray that, there is another shoulder underneath it. So yeah. it's been raised up. So he up. had three shoulders. It's so been, he was... Been raised up yeah. afterwards to make him look deformed, yeah. but when they discovered his skeleton in the car park a few years ago, yeah. and they've they've done it, he did have a slight curvature of the black back. He yeah. didn't have a hump back, but he had like scoli- scoliosis. I think it's called. I'm not sure that's what, how you pronounce it. So he did have a bit of right. a curved back. So that portrait might have been accurate, but again, nobody did who is alive was there. Did he have a blue badge when he parked in the <laughs> car park? And then this talk of the uh, rather forgotten King Louis. <laughs> yes. So, had you heard of King Louis? Louis? I've not heard of King Louis at all. No. no. But do you want to explain that, Lisa, briefly? Right. King Louis was invited. To, he was the son of of the King of France, and he was invited over here by the barons when King John wouldn't do what he, they wanted him to do. So he got the Pope to sort. He, he sort of tried to side with the Pope. Though he did fall out with the Pope. I believe he got excommunicated, which was probably one of the worst things that could happen to a Catholic. Very painful. Um, so, but yeah, so they invited this Louis over and he actually ruled for almost a year after King yeah. John died until the Pope But as, te- as Terry pointed out, he never had the crown on his head. No. no. But several other kings never did either. No, Edward V and um, Edward VIII. The VIII, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful little series mm-hmm. and mm, it, it does... It does deserve to be known, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes. We have got it on DVD. Yes. Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> Couldn't lay our hands on it directly, but we've, we've watched it on YouTube. Yeah. But, yes. uh, but it, it just does demonstrate Terry's passion for yes. that subject. Yeah. And I always wonder, uh, because it's this thing about his, peri- his period of co-comedy conspirators, shall we say. Mm-hmm. If they'd not, not gone into comedy, you'd have had doctors and mm-hmm. lawyers... And historians, yes, yeah, working mm. in the field. And I do wonder whether Terry would have actually ended up on telly anyway, yes, presenting yeah. history, because there there is a bit of sort of the James Burke about him, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, and that sort of sense of humour, mm-hmm. but enthusiasm, yes. So I could almost imagine Terry Jones being on telly in 1972, doing this sort of stuff. Mm. You know, he, he, I, yeah. I think. I think his his character is such that he he's such a good actor and presenter that I think he would have ended up on telly even without Python. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he'd have had he would have had a loyal audience, mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. much have a loyal audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just one of those interesting one ifs that you, you say if you take Python out of the equation, yeah. where would these people? You know, where, where where would it have taken them? That, mm-hmm. That's the thing. Well, that's the thing. You go into 2004 to when this was broadcast. Mm. This is a different generation watching yeah. it now. So they're, they're not going to, unless they bought the DVDs, they're not going to watch Python, are they? Yeah. It, it's not being sold on the, <laughs> on the you know, Monty Python's Terry Jones's Medieval Lives. Mm. It's just Terry Jones's Medieval Lives. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I just want to say as well, there is a, book that accompanies this series fantastic book yeah yes. and you can buy it on um kindle obviously there are quite hardback copies available if you yeah. look for them but when you read it you can yeah. hear his voice absolutely I, like I've, I've read it it's yeah. like he's telling you the story yeah you can i can when i started to read it i could actually hear him telling it to me in my ear yeah no I, which I, is the sign of a good writer i absolutely. agree with that it's a very clear voice yeah and telling you stuff that you remember. Yes. And th- that's, that's brilliant. So, so we thank you for that, Terry, yes, wherever indeed. you are. Thank you, Terry. Uh-huh. In the uh, pub, probably. Yeah, uh, with Graham Chapman. Yeah. And Neil. And Neil, yeah. yeah. So there we are. There's, te- there's Terry Jones's Medieval Lives. And mm-hmm. there is Round the Archives done again. Mm-hmm. So thank you to everybody who's been involved 
mm. this time round. Yes. And we've already got quite a lot in the can yeah. for future issues. For 46 yeah, onwards. I'm, I'm amazed what arrived mm-hmm. today. I won't say any more yet. No. So thank you to everyone. And yes. We'll see you again soon. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>